Justin's ready to play this morning. The blind man and made him see. He cast demons out of the man from gathering. You say, Come on. He cleansed the leper too. He made the blind man new. He brought hope back in a hopeless life. I testify to you. And he sets you free Cause when Jesus sets you free You are free indeed Oh, how sweet Hope 
of earth and joy of heaven precious name oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven come on everybody sing precious name Oh, how sweet hope of earth, hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name. Say, come on, precious thing. Oh, how Oh, Church, lift your voice and sing. Come on, precious name. sing at the name of Jesus bow at the name of Jesus bow falling prostrate at his feet falling prostrate at his feet king of kings in heaven will crown him king of kings in heaven will crown when our journey is complete
choir sing this. I love the
Aleluya. This is my uh, this is my second time in church today. I've already been in church earlier this morning in my dreams. I had an awesome dream. Now, it was a dream, so it wasn't, you know, I'm not saying that, you know. I don't believe it was a hot dog dream, but I'm not saying it was a God dream either, but it, I sure was anointed in there. <laughs> Chili and hot dogs ain't never done that for me. I dreamed we was in a meeting here in Brownsville, and I dreamed a presence came in this place unlike anything I'd ever felt. I'm serious. Unlike anything I'd ever experienced, it knocked me to the floor so hard, I sat down just like that on the floor on my posterior. And I remember it almost knocked the breath out of me. And as soon as I hit the floor, I said, my God, what was that? And I remember I looked, and Lyndall was in the dream. And I remember he was over there by Russ Price, and I saw Russ mouthing some words. Listen, I saw Russ mouthing some words, and I saw him mouthing them in Lyndall's ear. And I said, Lyndall, what did he say? And by that time, Russ turned to me and he said, I said, there's a sweet spirit in this house. <laughs> I was still sitting down. I was still sitting down, and when he said that, when he said, there's a sweet spirit in this place, when he said that, I saw signs and wonders break out all over Brownsville. I mean, people, listen, people started being healed and delivered. Just a cloud moved in this place. Now, it was only a dream, but, whoo. After, you, uh, after you've been in church like that, I want to see it happen. I believe, hey, listen, let me tell you something. I want everybody in this place to listen to me. You can be downcast and down in the mouth if you want to. That's your business. And I know that all of us have our loads to bear. You can be downcast, down in the mouth, depressed discouraged, going through all kind of stuff if you want to. And it'll get worse and worse the more attention you pay to it. But it's time to shake that garbage off. Listen, I said it's time to shake that garbage off. There's times I have to shake all kind of stuff off. I mean major stuff. To even get up behind a pulpit to minister. You just shake that garbage off. It's time, like David said, he encouraged himself in the Lord. When other people won't encourage you, bless God, just encourage yourself in the Lord. Get yourself by the bootstraps. Pull yourself up and say, God is good. God is great. And he's greatly to be praised. I may be going through hell, but I done dreamed about heaven. Heaven's going to come down. You believe that? Woo! Well, I wish I was preaching this morning. But I got Dick Mills here, the prophet I was telling you about last week. The man is 79 years old, been preaching the gospel 54 years, and God uses him powerfully in the prophetic, and he's going to come in a few moments, and I believe the Lord's going to speak to our church. But uh, I want to just tell you, friend, listen, get your eyes, hear me, listen to me. I want you to hear your pastor. Many of you have got your eyes like this. You've got a downward look. The Lord constantly said, lift up your head. You know, if you lift up your head, it's hard to look down. You know what I'm saying? I believe wherever your head goes, your eyes goes. Amen? Look down for a minute like this. That feels bad, don't it? Shoulders are slumped. You're looking down. There ain't nothing to see. All you can see is maybe six feet, five feet, however tall you are. But lift up your eyes now. Look how much further you can see. If that wall wasn't back yonder, if that wall wasn't back yonder, you reckon we need to open the doors again? 
Might need to open them up again. If them doors wasn't back there and that wall back, wasn't back there, your you sight just keep on going. Now the Lord said, lift up your eyes, look upon the fields. They're already white unto harvest. And I tell you what, lift up your eyes further like that. You can see stars thousands of miles away. You can see the moon a quarter of a million miles away. So listen, if you want to look down, about six feet is all you're going to get. And it may take you six feet under, I don't know. But lift up your eyes, I'm telling you. It's not time to be discouraged. It's not time to be downtrodden. These are, the, I believe that we are entering into some of the greatest days that the body of Christ has ever lived. I believe that. That's not rhetoric. Hear me. Listen. I said that is not rhetoric. I'm tired of rhetoric. I can't live my life off some kind of rhetoric from a preacher. This is not rhetoric. This is Bible. The Bible said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. On your sons, on your daughters, your old men, your maids, your handmaids, I'll pour out my spirit, God said. He said they'll do all kind of stuff whenever I pour out my spirit on them. And I made up my mind, I want what God's got for me. Hang your harp on the will if you want to, friend. We're marching ahead. Hallelujah. Sing some, bro. Sing some with some beat to it. I'm going to do it. All right. Do you feel the mountains tremble? Do you hear the ocean roar? When the people rose to sing out, Jesus Christ the risen one.
the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Let the oil of gladness flow down from your throne. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness.
25% of this audience is participating. 75% is like this. I'm telling you, lift up your head. Lift up your feet. Oh, come on now. Don't watch me jog in place up here on the platform. All I can do is jog, friend. I can't, move, I can't cut no moves or nothing. All I can do is jog in place. But I do that before the Lord. Now, some of you was raised and you dance. I don't. My wife asked me one time after we got married, she said, would you dance with me? I said, sure. She never asked me again. Her toes and toenails was bleeding. I mean, it was bad, friend. After a while, she just said, let me put my feet on top of yours and you just walk around with me. So I did that. I can't dance. But I tell you what, we can make a joyful noise. And we can just move a little bit. I want you to do this right now. Come on, everybody, do this with me. Everybody, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're mad at me. I don't care if you hate my guts. I want you to do this. Pull your head down like this. Now take your hand under your chin and pull your head up like that. There, now, all right, don't you feel better? We're gonna do this one more time. I want that fiddle girl over there. I want you to play that thing, girl. Play that thing. Play that thing like Louisiana. Come on now. Come on. Move, folks. Move.
glory. Right now, my mind is in the book of the Revelation. The last chapter. I don't know what chapter you're in right now, but my mind's on the last chapter. We win. I tell you what, whatever you're going through, whatever you've been going through, just remember, it all fades out in the last chapter of the book of Revelation. We win. So devil, you're not going to hang that over us anymore. As a matter of fact, while this service has been going on, a lot of people's yesterdays and todays has already left them. I feel that. Whoo, man. I sure would like to preach this morning. Glory to God. I think I'd preach about my dream this morning. I think I'd call it my earlier service today. I remember Russ looked at me and he said, Pastor, there's a sweet spirit in this place. That's what I said. I woke up. I turned over. I said, Brenda, I just had a dream. She said, <laughs> <laughs> so I lay there and just reveled in it till she woke up. It don't take much to get that woman excited. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I'm going to let everybody go ahead and be seated. And we're going to go ahead and bring this man of God on, let him talk to us a little bit. Y'all enjoy the Brownsville Choir. And the musicians, aren't we blessed to have good musicians? <laughs> Handsome musicians at that. I know, Stand up, Charlie. Come here, buddy. Let everybody see you in a minute. Come here, man. Come here, Charlie. <sighs> Hallelujah. You're in trouble. Man, this, this boy here plays a guitar like none other. He's one of our guitarists on the worship team. He's the one that does all that fancy string work. And he's single. He's single. He's single. The boy's single. He's going to stay that way, too. He's going to stay that way about and 10 more years. His mom and daddy's up in the balcony, and they said, leave him alone. <laughs> How old are you now, man? 20. <laughs> Brenda, here's one for you, girl. He's 20 years old. He's still single. Brenda, stay out of it. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, we got some wonderful musicians. These guys are just absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good choir. How many in the choir is single? Let me see your hand. Stand up. Y'all single. Stand up. Carol, I've been trying for years. For years. Would somebody please help me with this girl right here? <laughs> right there. Stand up, Carol. I want everybody to see who you are. This girl can sing. Yes, she can. Listen. Listen. Those of you in the overflow, those of you watching by tape, anybody, just anybody, stand back. Huh? But I am. <clears throat> this woman can sing. She's pretty. She's sweet. She loves her mama. She is a sweet girl. How old are you now? <clears throat> hey. <clears throat> she said it's irrelevant. <laughs> but we want to fix these people up, friends. The rest of you stand up again one more time. All right. Spirit-filled, godly men. And women. And women. Yeah, we don't. Spirit-filled, godly men and women out there. Wants to serve the Lord. You got some good servants of God up here that, that's not married. <sighs> Hallelujah. That old girl over there can sing too in the back. <clears throat> Stand up over there, Melody. This is Melody Ward. This is Allison's mother. This is my daughter in law's mother, Elizabeth's mother. This woman here is pretty. She sings good. <clears throat> She's a school teacher. She, sh she can support you. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Did she fall out? <laughs> no, there she is. <laughs> Everybody stand up one more time. Hallelujah. Turn around and greet several people near you. Would you do that? Love on them a little bit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. It's a real privilege this morning to welcome to our pulpit a man that we love. Brother Dick Mills is, um, as I told you when I met him out in Van Nuys, California, Brother Hayford's church. Brother Hayford said, John, you want to meet a prophet of the Lord? And I said, yes. And so he said, well, here's Dick Mills. And um, I met Dick out there back, I think, in 1996 or 97, I forget. But he's a wonderful man. And um, we believe that the Lord has him here this morning to minister a word of encouragement to this body. Would you please welcome Dick Mills? Let me love on you. Hey, everybody hold your... I said, no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'm anxious to hear that message that he got in that dream. <laughs> hold your Bible up, would you? I'm going to give you five scriptures that say that this book is food for the soul. So everybody say it. This book is food for the soul. Keep it up, First Peter. Th don't go too far away, Lindo, because I got a word for you and the missus in a few minutes here. So it's about a new song. I, I just want to. I got that word this morning. Just say from First Peter three three. Desire the milk of the word, so you can grow up. Say it with me from Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. Your words were found, and I did eat them. Your words were the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Say it with me from Psalms 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey in my mouth. So when you hear Jackie Gleason on the honeymooners say, it doesn't get any sweeter than this, folks. He's talking about this book right here. Say it with me from Job 23, 12. I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Said with me Deuteronomy 8.3, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that's in the book. Bang the person next to you with your Bible and say, come on, lady, get in the book. Come on, guy, get in the book. Hallelujah. Boy, I tell you what, the electricity is here today. Wow. A friend of mine was in a real cold church recently. It was, a, it was dead. It's just cold. You can always tell a cold church because somebody opens the front door and a light goes on. You know, those, those are real cold churches. First church of the fridge. <laughs> And he said, it was so dead that a man on the first row had a fatal heart attack, and they called 911. And 911 carried 20 bodies out before they found the guy that had the heart attack. You know? <laughs> Tap the person next and say, it'll never happen here. <laughs> that beautiful lady in the second row, Betty Mills, farm girl from Southern Illinois, Southern Baptist, and came to California and became head nurse at St. Vincent's Hospital. And I was holding a revival in her church, and she was working there. She was head nurse on the fourth floor at St. Vincent's in downtown L.A. Came out after the service was over, walked in with her nurse's uniform, and uh, I started having physical reactions in my body. My heart started palpitating. My blood pressure went up. My knees turned to rubber. 
And I took a turn for the nurse right then and there. <laughs> so I got her outside there and we had a date and I just said, I have a word from the Lord for you. She says, you do? And I says, yeah, marry me. <laughs> So Betty, stand up and throw kisses at everybody. 44 years. Oh, gets better all the time. Uh, can you believe it? Like I'm 79 and she's 74. And we got a call from Butch Halderman at Yale Washington. He said, we got 50 couples. And we got the Sheraton Hotel in the Portland Reserve. We'd like to have you come for Thursday night, Friday night. Put on a marriage seminar. I was 75 at the time. Betty was 70. And he says, we got 50 couples. Nobody's over 35. And I said, Butch, that's a 40-year gap. I'm 75. Nobody's over 35. How does a 75-year-old person talk to 35-year-olders about love, marriage, passion, the bedroom, intimacy, he said, well, you do what all 70-year-olders do. You just talk about it. <laughs> and I said, Butch, that is a cheap shot if I ever got one. You know? He said, the reason we're having you, you guys have been married longer than we're old. <laughs> I got to tell you, I was on Long Island about a month ago, and two months ago, and they told me a funny story about the Bronx. Six guys from the Bronx went up to the pearly gates and St. Peter said, where are you gentlemen from? And uh, they said, we're from the Bronx. He said, you know, that's a high crime neighborhood area. We don't really have too many people from the Bronx ever show up. He said, I want you guys to stay right here. I gotta go check this out. St. Peter goes into the inner city, goes into the room where the Lord is, full of glory. He says, Lord, we have six gentlemen from the Bronx. They went in. What's their chances? And the Lord says, let them in. So he goes back out to the Purdy Gates, gets on the intercom, and he says, they're gone. And the Lord says, the six men from the Bronx? And he says, no, the Purdy Gates. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to say it. It will never happen in Pensacola. <laughs> My first prophecy to the gathering, I already had a great time with the school yesterday, and I'll tell you about that later. It was terrific. But my first prophecy for the church, and I was going to give this prophecy before the pastor ever started picking out all the single people up there. Now, this is not reproof or rebuke or chastisement, but everything he said about singles was how good they could sing. My first question is, can they cook? <laughs> Why don't you ask that question next time? You know, <laughs> they're good cooks. <laughs> anyway, my first prophecy is there's going to be a lot of weddings in this church the next 18 months. Lots of them. Everybody say it. Lots of weddings in this church. And I'll tell you why. There's life here. There is life here big time. And when things are alive, things happen. Wow. Prophecy number two. Well, I'm going to go back to prophecy number one. For all you young ladies that are single, there's a good scripture that you can claim for matrimony. It's a good scripture, and it'll work. It just says, if any man will come after me, let him. You know. I mean, it is a great word. <laughs> Let's don't discourage it. <laughs> Prophecy number two, lots of babies. Everybody say it, lots of babies. Oh. We got parents and grandparents here that have children in cold formal churches and they're not reproducing. And the reason why, the church doesn't have any life. You've got to get your kids out of those dead, cold, formal churches and get them over here. Because there's life here. Even if your daughter is fertile Myrtle, she's married to sterile Merrill, and they aren't going anywhere. <laughs> get them out of there and get them over here. Everybody said, lots of babies. I want to give you ladies a break. If you're not in the baby thing, wave me off. Would you just get your hands out and wave me off? Okay. 
there's a guy back there waving me off. What's, what's that guy doing? Notice we said the weddings first and then the babies. I've had 16,000 services since 1939. And I was in one church in Mississippi where they were having lots of weddings because they were having lots of premature eight-pound babies being born in the congregation. So everybody said the weddings first, then the babies. Did you hear about the couple in Tennessee that had quadruplets? They said, we're going to name them Eeny, Meeny, Miny, and Charlie. <laughs> Somebody said, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, and Charlie. They said, yeah, we don't want no mo." <laughs> <laughs> Everybody said, lots of weddings, lots of babies. Lots of babies. I met a man this morning and the Holy Spirit just jumped inside of me. He goes, boom, a big release. Carrie and Shirley Robertson. Can you get Shirley? Is she here? Hey, Shirley, come on up, would you? And Brenda, I'd like to have you come up too because I got a word for you. Lindell, is Amber here? Yeah, okay, good enough. We got a piece of paper here that says a word from the Lord just for you. Betty will write it down. Let me just take the two of you first, Carrie and Shirley. Aren't these beautiful people? You guys are beautiful. My prophetic words come through scriptures. And when I met you, Carrie. I just got a great word in Job 42.10 and Job 42.12. And it said, the Lord blessed the last days of Job more than his first days. And it just said, the Lord gave Job twice as many blessings at the end of his life as what he started out with. And I just got a double portion word for you. Isaiah 61, 7. You paid a price, big time, just to be standing right here. It has cost you because there were people in your family and your friends that had other plans for you. And all your life, there were people who were trying to squeeze you into a mold of what they thought you ought to be. But you chose to identify with the born-again people and you chose to identify, and that cost you. You chose to identify with the Spiritfield people, and that cost you. Then you chose to identify with the Brownsville. And Isaiah 61 7 says, Satan has tried to put you down, embarrass you, and humiliate you because of your commitment and dedication to doing the will of the Lord. But it says, for everything you've had to put up with adversarial wise, he said, I'm giving you a double portion of blessing. <laughs> Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? Carrie and Shirley, you got to read me. I'm not a prophet for pay that goes around telling people what they want to hear so they'll feel good about themselves. But I am an encourager. I have been for 54 years. Zechariah 9.12 says, you've never given up on your dreams. You've never given up on your hopes. You've never given up on the promises. You've never given up on yourself. Because you've known all your life that before it was over, God was going to do the extraordinary, the unusual, and the special in your life. And you've kept hope locked up in your heart all these years. Never gave up on it. Never gave up on your dreams. And it says in Zechariah 9, 12, because you've kept hope in your heart, he said, I'm going to give you a double portion. And I just need to tell you that Job was 70 when he got that scripture. And he lived 140 years after that, and the Lord doubled everything up. I want everybody to point out to Carrie and Shirley and just say, there's a lot of good mileage left in you too. (laughs) 
And I want you to reach out and say, don't plan on checking out just yet. Now, everybody can take these words, so hold your Bible up and say, hey, I'll take that. All right. Isn't that great? Praise God. Thank you, dude. Yes, sir. Betty's got it on a piece of paper. I want to minister to Brenda uh, individually and then also Pastor John. So, Brenda, could you come up here? Betty, come on up and stand with me, would you? Hallelujah. We've had uh, friends that go here that have sent us your videos on the water baptisms, Pastor John's and the worships. And the, I, I, I just feel like we're part of something that's already happening here, you know. Maybe you're meeting us for the first time, but we have met you big time, long time ago. First 90 days you're in this world, a godly relative, either a grandmother or an aunt, or Sunday school teacher, somebody picked you up out of the crib, the bassinet, and prayed. You're only less than 90 days old. Take Brenda's life. Use her for your glory. And give her the gifts, the talents, the abilities, and the enablements that will speed up the second coming of the Lord. That prayer was prayed in less than 90 days in this world. God put four gifts in you that have been resident all this time. Now, this is not minimizing the fact that you are anointed and that you are a terrific mother and a terrific wife and a terrific pastor's wife. And it's not minimizing what you're doing, but there's something in you just waiting to be activated. And it's been there all this time. The Latins call it in potentia. It's there potentially, latent. It's just there, waiting to be activated. And one of them is a gift of healing through the laying out of hands, where people are going to be touched by you and power is going through them. And they're going to be so restored that it's going to be as though they never had a sickness in the first place. It's going to be so dramatic. The other, the working of miracles, miracles in marriages, miracles in ministries, and miracles in finances. You're going to be a liberator from people that have got a yoke of financial adversity over them. And you have a discerning gift right now, but he's going to really accelerate it. And I, if you don't know it, folks, Brenda has radar. And you mothers that have teenage daughters that are starting to get romantically inclined and getting interested in matrimony, bring the young man past Brenda's radar screen <laughs> and let her sit there and put the scope on this dude. And if Brenda shakes her head, no, the kid's dead in the water. I want you to know that. <laughs> when did you discover she had radar? <laughs> it was working even then. <laughs> But he showed me that he's going to give you a kind of a radar discernment that will let you know what the secrets of people's hearts are. And he's not going to let anybody come on board that has a hidden agenda marching to a different drum beat and not able to cooperate and submit to the authority of the church. God's going to show you uh, that kind of perversity in people. You're going to be spared a lot of grief and heartache. And there's just a word of knowledge that's waiting to be activated where you just know things. You just know things. You know when things are right and you know things are wrong. But let me tell you about these four gifts. The reason I called you out of the audience is the Holy Spirit gave me the word that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You might wonder why these four gifts didn't become full orbed, fully blown, and fully developed. They've been there. God's been waiting for a certain moment, and the moment is now. Esther 4.14. Everybody reach out and say, Sister Brenda, Sister Brenda. Who, knows? who knows 
Whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Second Timothy 1 6, you're going to stir up the gifts that are in you. You're going to have a wisdom beyond your years, a vocabulary beyond your education. You're going to see instantaneous things happen that's going to leave you speechless. You're going to stir up the gifts. First Timothy 4 14, you're not going to neglect any of the gifts. They're not going to fall into disuse. And 1 Corinthians 1, 7, you're not going to come behind in any gift while you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. The big thing is God's getting ready to do a new thing, better than ever. And we've had to get through what we've got through in order to get to where we are right now so we can get to where we're going. And uh, this is your day. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord's been showing you for a long time that before the coming of the Lord that there were certain things going to happen in your life and Habakkuk 2, 3, you've lived with for over 25 years. The vision is for an appointed time, though it tarry, you wait for it. It's going to come to pass, it won't delay. But now, Ezekiel 12, 28 is bringing that vision that was for the appointed time up to the now and now. Ezekiel 12, 28, everybody said, none of my promises, hold your Bible up, none of my promises to you shall be delayed any longer. But that word I've given you is going to come to pass. Everybody say it right now. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 300 people are out of work in Lubbock needing a job. And a factory came and said, you know, we're going to put people to work. But you got to fill out a questionnaire. So... Text, he needed a job bad. And there's 200 questions on it. And he'd only gone to the fourth grade, and his writing skills and reading skills weren't too good. So he gets, he's brain dead by the time he gets to 199. He's got one question to answer. And when, that question is, how soon can you go to work? And he, he's just brain weary. And he said to his buddy, how do you spell rat? And he says, R-A-T spells rat. And he says, no, I don't mean that. I mean right now. You know, how soon can you go to work? Right now. So I want everybody to say it. God is a present help. In any time of trouble, bang the person next to you and say, right now. <laughs> Come on up here, Pastor. I got a great word for you. Oh. The thing that God's called you to do, His purposes and His plans, are coming to fruition on an accelerated scale. Romans 9.28 said, I'm going to finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because I'm going to do a quick, short summary terminating final work and you're the man for the last day outpouring of the spirit and everything up till now has been a preparation a grooming a conditioning and an educating and training process to get you ready you've gotten past landmines booby traps obstacle courses roadblocks you've been through things that the Hallmark card company doesn't have a card that covers what it was you've been through <laughs> you could read the whole name of all the cards and you're not there they're going to have to invent one for you but I've got a word that says in Isaiah 60 verse number 1 arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Darkness is going to cover the earth. And a gloomy mental oppression, depression is going to cover the minds of people. But upon you will my light shine. Upon you will my glory be conspicuous. Isaiah 33.10 says, Now will I rise. 
now will I be exalted and now will I be lifted up and I just want you to know that your best days are ahead Ecclesiastes 7.14 says better are the days Ecclesiastes 7.1 everybody said better are the days ahead of you than any day you've had yet I know it's horrible English, but I want you all to reach out to Pastor and say, Pastor John, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Let me give you 2 Chronicles 29, 35 and 36. No, this goes with it too. 2 Chronicles 29, 35 and 36. And it says everything was set in order. It was all put together. And here's what it says. I just want to give it to you. The service of the house of the Lord was set in order. God set it in order. Second Chronicles 29, 35 and 36 says, The leadership rejoiced, and all the people that worshipped rejoiced. God had prepared the people and the thing was done suddenly. Suddenly. And the story is his daddy took 16 years to shut the temple down. He just shut it down and closed it. So for 16 years they didn't have any temple. Hezekiah comes in and in 16 days had it back. I want everybody to say the Lord is accelerating. Speeding speeding up and just uh, hurrying up the process of reviving his people and I want everybody to point out and say you're the man now I want you to gross him out just say go get him tiger <laughs> okay not great hey Lindell get Amber and the two of you come up here where are you, Amber? Oh, boy. Listen, if that baby's asleep, don't wake him up. <laughs> we used to have such a tough time getting our kids to sleep that when they were asleep, oh, we didn't want to discourage it. He's going to be okay. Yeah. Every great revival has had its music. Oh, let him come up here. Lyndall, do you have other children? This, this one and one on the way. Oh, boy. Well, we got a three-fold chord here. Ecclesiastes 4.12. We got Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. <laughs> He's saying, He's looking at me like, is this guy for real? <laughs> Every revival's had new hymnology. So the Lord spoke to me to call you up and tell you that there's going to be a new song. And Second Chronicles 20, verse 22 and 23, it's a militant song. It says, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, God said ambushments against their enemies, and they were smitten. Oh, hallelujah. And Psalms 32, 8, he said, I'm going to give you an original song, and it's going to be creative, and it's going to be anointed, it's going to be prophetic. And it's going to be a song, uh, Isaiah, thir uh, Psalms 32, 7. He said, I'm going to give you a song. And when you sing it, chains are going to come off of people. Healings are going to take place. And while the choir was singing this morning, the Lord says, the day's coming that while worship's going on, souls are going to be saved. Backsliders are going to be reclaimed. Sick people are going to get healed. <laughs> Believers are going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Deliverances are going to take place. Demons are coming out. And he showed me that there's going to be a music that's going to be a liberating music. And then all Pastor John has to do uh, when it comes to message time is to explain to the people what happened the first 45 minutes, you know. Just want to tell you what happened, you know. And it's going to be a happening. But everybody say it. The Lord's giving you a song, Lord, you a song. that will set people free. Set and it's a song of deliverance. Song of deliverance. And then Isaiah 30, 29. 
This is interesting because there are people that are getting radically turned off of MTV and uh, all the uh, sounds that are out there in the world system and getting radically turned on to the Lord. And uh, the music is going to be the draw. And Isaiah 30, 29 said there's going to be people coming through the doors that have never been in church in their life. And when they come in, all they have is a misconception or preconceived idea as to what church is all about. And the only conception some people have is what they see on TV or in the movies, which is misconception. So Isaiah 30, 29 says you're going to have a song. And when it's sung... It's going to put a spirit of conviction on frivolous, superficial, shallow, la da people that are just party animals and looking for fun and games. And they're just going to be sobered up immediately by the very presence of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Isaiah 30, 29. It says there's going to be a holy solemnity that's going to come over the unsaved people. John, Mark 14, 26 and God's going to give you words too. He's releasing the poetic thing within you. You're going to uh, find words rhyming. And, and uh, I, I see the two of you flowing together in, in the prophetic and the anointed music. Mark 14, 26, it says, They sang a hymn, and they went out into the Mount of Olives. 1875, a French couple discovered that in the diacritical marks of the Hebrew alphabet, there were also... In the Psalms, rhythmic notations of the tempo of the song. And this song that they sang was 118th Psalm. And it was a foot tapper of all the songs in the Bible. It was called the Hallel Psalm. It's where we get the word hallelujah. And on paper, you don't think of Jesus and the 11 disciples getting ready to go to the crucifixion singing a foot tapping rap song, you know, a jive song. But they sang a hymn. It was a happy song. But what it did was condition them and got them ready for the rejection and the crucifixion. God is going to let you have music and people that are going to get beat up out there by the world system and maligned by the media and criticized by the liberal press and just, you know, just go through a war zone all week. They're going to come to church and you're going to have music that's going to put band-aids on them. It's going to put bandages on them. It's going to heal them and it's going to get them ready for the future. You're going to have that hallelujah song, that hallelujah song, the song that helps Christians get into the combat zone and win the battles. Hallelujah. How many discovered that when you got born again, you were right into a war zone immediately? <laughs> Nikki Cruz said, when I got saved, I lost 75% of my vocabulary, you know. <laughs> and one more, everybody say it. A prophetic song of deliverance. A song for tearing down strongholds. A, whole, a song that brings holy solemnity. An earthquake, uh, a song that uh, gives refreshing and recuperation to beat up saints. <laughs> and then, there's the earthquake song, Acts 16, verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. And all of a sudden, there was an earthquake. God is going to give Pensacola an earthquake song that's going to open up colleges, universities, business establishments, country clubs, <laughs> and inner cities. It's going to open up areas, an earthquake song that's going to open up areas that have never been opened up before. As a result of this song, at 8 a.m. the next morning, they had their foot on European soil. Nobody had ever been there before. So I want everybody to say it. A song for pulling down strongholds. A song of deliverance. A song that brings holy solemnity. A song that brings recovery and refreshment. And an earthquake song that's going to open up the rock stations to the song of the Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to write one. Thank you. Thank you. He's got music in him, you know what? You got music in him. Did you know you got music in you? 
All yes. he knows is he was asleep and somebody woke him up. <laughs> Hallelujah. At an early age, the Holy Spirit's going to move on him. By the time he's three years old, you're going to start recognizing spiritual phenomena in his life. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Okay. Everybody hold up your Bible. And say, the answer's in the book. Bang the person next to you and say, get in the book. I teach in six schools of the Bible around the country, seminaries, Toronto, Rodney Howard Brown School, the River, Billy Joe's Victory Bible Institute, Christ for the Nations in Dallas, Jack Hayford's seminary. And we got to minister to about 50 of the people in your training place over there, your training group, you were, you know, your Bible school, Brownsville Revival Center School there. And my wife and I, when we got home, were overawed at the caliber of students that we met and teachers. And I know it's apples and oranges because the Bible says that if we try to compare ourselves with ourselves and among ourselves, we're, we're not using wisdom. So we're not making any comparisons, but besides me going around with the prophetic word, I have a language resource library and I go to schools and show people how to do word studies. And how many of you have that Spirit-Filled Life Bible? Let me see the hands of everybody that's got one of those. Every time you see the word wealth in there, there's 550 of them. My son and I, there's one right there, yeah. My son and I spent four years critiquing 550 Greek and Hebrew words. And they put it in there called word wealth. And now, this November, they've got the 10th anniversary and they're completely rewriting the thing. I'm, I'm working on a whole bunch of new synonyms and, and words. People do not associate me with scholarship because, you know, it's, it's, this is more spectacular, it's more glamorous, it's more dramatic. But my real love is researching scriptures. And anyway, we ministered yesterday and found a receptivity that was awesome. And my wife got one word in her heart, and that is purity. She said, there is a purity there in this school that is awesome. And the word I got was commitment, a commitment to excellence. And it's interesting how the terminology in spirit field ranks has changed in the last 20 years. 1970 and 1980, you know what the talk was? Signs, wonders, miracles, crowds, charisma, shakers and movers. But there's a new terminology that's taken place in spirit field ranks. And you know what it is? It's called accountability integrity, relationships, being able to submit to authority, being a team player. And I don't have the best discernment in the world because I'm a people person. I just reach out to people. But we didn't, we met the staff, we met the students. I didn't feel anybody marching to a different drumbeat. I didn't feel anybody with a secret agenda. I want to tell you, we recommend this school. And I just hope I can come back and spend some more time with the students. It was awesome. <laughs> Praise God. Everybody stand up. I want to close this part of it by giving you a prophetic word for where Brownsville is with Jesus right now. Hallelujah. We got people in the church world that preach the historical Jesus. And they confine miracles to the days in which Jesus and the apostles were alive. And their whole message is, Jesus, the great I was. And then you got these fighting fundies that are living in the book of Revelation. And all they can talk about is when Jesus is coming 
And they've even got it charted out. He's coming between the first and second trumpet, third and fourth seal, and sixth and fifth vial, like that, you know. I mean, they got it charted out. And the only message they got is, Jesus, the great I will be. But I got good news. We're doing something more than Jesus, the great I was, and Jesus, the great I will be. We're preaching Jesus, the great I am. Everybody put your Bible up. Let's praise the Lord. This is where it's at. Say it. Jesus is the great I am. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. We were watching on the Gaither tapes, and this guy said he got a Sunday bulletin in a church, and the Sunday morning message was Jesus walking on the water. And the Sunday night message was entitled, The Search for Jesus. <laughs> and the guy says, I think he should have preached those two, two other times. Here's the prophetic word, and it's going to be strictly from Scripture. Brownsville, Pensacola, Revival. Exodus 14, 15. <laughs> Speak to the children of Israel. Sorry about that. <laughs> Could you delete that from the tape? <laughs> Boy, you guys got a good sound system here, I can tell you that. I don't even dare clear my throat. It's going to go <laughs> all over the world. Hey, everybody say it. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to go forward. That's the word. Here's the thing. You never stop growing. Somebody told me years ago, when growth stops, decay sets in. Say it, when growth stops, decay sets in. When I hit 70, some pastor said to me, how does it feel to be 70? And I says, I think I'm getting mellow. He goes over and gets a big third international dictionary out and turns to the word mellow and says, hey, guy, look at it. I don't think you want to use that word. I'm saying, I'm getting mellow. And I looked up at the word mellow, and it says fruit that is going soft, you know? <laughs> so say to the person next to you, no Millerinis in Pensacola and Brownsville. Oh, hallelujah. The song that describes Brownsville revival is one of the verses in Amazing Grace that says, through many dangers, toils and snares we have already come and that's your word you've gotten past landmines booby traps roadblocks obstacle courses through many dangers toils and snares we have already come grace has got us safe this far grace going to take us on through. Bang the person next to you say, we're still on our feet. We're still in the race. Hallelujah. Still on our feet. Still in the race. They have a tree in California called Sequoia. Some of them are 4,000 years old. They put a bore, and they can save it and bring it out, and they can give you a history of the tree, because the tree gets a ring every year. See, and the Lord told us about ourselves in Isaiah 65, 22. He says, your days are going to be like the days of a tree. Well, it takes a year to get a ring, and it's microscopic, and it's slow growth. But the good thing is, every year that goes by, the tree's going out, and the roots are going down, the branches are going up. So this ranger pulls this thing out, 
He said, I want you to look closely. And every ring was microscopic and they could date the years. And then they went back to 1867 and there was a ring and a ring like that in about an inch of space. He says, you notice how wide this one is compared to all these other rings? He said, 400,000 acres in the high Sierras caught on fire and burned all the trees down except these trees. He said, this tree has a tannic acid right under its bark. And there's three things that attack the tree. One is fire, one is lightning, and one is a certain kind of beetle. And he said, every time the tree gets attacked, this tannic acid starts multiplying and causes the tree to grow by leaps and bounds. I couldn't get over it. I'm counting all these rings and they're microscopic and all of a sudden, boom! He said, in one year, this tree grew more than it had in the last 50 years. But it was because of the attack. The Lord began to deal with me about Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Why the attack? Well, it's a basic fundamental rule in life that prosperity brings out all your vices. People that prosper can become arrogant, conceited, become power brokers, push people around, have a pride factor and have a contempt factor. And you've seen it out in the world system. Prosperity brings out all your vices, but adversity brings out all your virtues. Everybody say it. Prosperity can bring out your vices, but adversity brings out your virtues. Mary has an alabaster box, 12 ounces of ointment, the costliest fragrant, the most aromatic fragrant used for embalming, Sealed. Nobody gets any benefits. They could say, what you got in there? And she could say something. But when Mary broke the alabaster box, you had a house filled with the aroma. And I don't want to gross you out, but 15 men had just walked up a hill from Jerusalem on a hot April day, perspiring, going into a room with no cross ventilation, no air conditioning, no breeze. And you have an aroma of human perspiration. The next thing you know, it's superseded by an aroma that's exhilarating. And it's the broken places that really show your commitment, your dedication. See, Exodus 1.21 says, Exodus 1.12 says, they were making progress. They were making good progress. But an enemy came out to fight him, to hinder him, to block them. And I just want you to know that you've taken some hits. And it's been a satanic thing trying to put the fire out. But you know what it says in Exodus 1, 12? The more the enemy fought them, the stronger they became. The more they multiplied and grew. I just want to tell you, Satan has gone too far in the last five years coming against this program here and he shot himself in the foot because now there's going to be a rapid accelerating growth as a result of it. That dude made a big mistake when he came against you. Say it with me from Exodus 1.12. The more the enemy fought him, the stronger they became. The more they multiplied and grew. grew. Say to the person next to you, we're still in the race. (laughs) We're still on our feet. Hallelujah. Paul said in Philippians 1.12, I want to tell you, I've taken the hits big time, but I want to tell you the things that have happened to me have happened for the furtherance of my faith. Oh. 
Psalm 66, 12 said, men have run over us roughshod. I mean, they have steamrolled us, left us face down in the mud and stomped on us and laughed at us. Paul said, I mean, David said, we've had people that were just insensitive to us, just run over us. We've been through fire and we've been through flood. But he says, now, we're not going to lay down and die. We're not going to roll over and quit breathing. We're not going to go back to the way things were when you had a traditional church. Yeah, some people say that. Why can't we go back to the way it was? There's no going back. He told Moses, tell him to go forward. Man, there's nothing to go back to. And it says, we went, the men went over us. We went through fire. We went through flood. But now the Lord's bringing us out. King James says, to a wealthy place. New King James says, to a place of abundant refreshing Moffat's translation says to a place of great moisture. In other words, he's going to bring us out and that river is going to be better than ever. Oh, hallelujah. Booker T. Washington said, success is not measured by attainment, accomplishment, and achievement. Say it with me. Success is not measured by attainment, accomplishment and achievement but success is determined this is Booker T. Washington's word success is determined by how much adversity you have been able to get through hallelujah I'm going through Jesus Lord I've started to walk in the light Betty and I are driving across Nebraska on our way to Colorado 30 foot trailer we're evangelists Pentecostal evangelists for 35 years had a mobile home travel trailer an evangelist goes around comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable this is what an evangelist does (laughs) the trailer jackknives the car breaks loose goes over a 40 foot embankment Leaves us at the bottom of the hill down there. Smashed. Our trailer runs into a siding. It gets semi-destroyed. Next night, we're supposed to be in Sterling, Colorado. I looked at my guitar. It was okay. I just bought her a brand new sewing machine. I looked at it, and it was okay. We get out of this car down in a ravine I've got the guitar in one hand I've got the sewing machine in the other hand and I'm helping Betty go right straight up the side of the cliff it's like Satan's trying to tell you it's all over buddy you've lost it you'll never get there we're up on the highway trailers wrecked car smashed while I'm climbing up the hill, Herbert Buffum's song came to me. Lord, I've started to walk in the light, shining on my pathway from heaven so bright. Living each moment with your face in view, I started in with Jesus, and I'm going through. <laughs> we got up there, and I said, Honey, if we have to hitchhike, to Colorado cars are made out of tin the tin can be replaced the trailer's made out of Bakelite plywood, pressed wood it can be replaced but one thing that can't be replaced is this thing that we have in us that says go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and it just was going over and over again I'm going through And I feel that same determination in your heart this morning. That you've survived the storm. Hallelujah. You've survived the storm. 
you're going through you're getting ready for the big thing God raised you up for in the first place when he raised this place up he raised it up to be an impact center for the whole wide world you've hit some speed bumps and let me tell you something whenever you go through adversity in a church the people causing the adversity are not the ones under or they're on trial you're the one on trial God wants to check your heart and see where you are in all this you got to make sure that because of things that have happened in the past you don't let bitterness get in it says in Proverbs 4.25 keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life and I'm not a bad news guy but I can point out casualties that have taken hits and got bitter and got angry and I can point people coast to coast that are sitting home in a rocket chair clipping coupons the anointing's gone the joy is gone the open doors are gone the ministry's gone and they're sitting there and says somebody stuck it to me and I'm going to get even with them if it's the last thing I do that's going to be the last thing they'll ever do you know what you've got to do you got to pick up and keep on going. I saw pastor's feet going up and down. I says, well, he's not etched in cement, I can tell you that. Hallelujah. I want you to say it. We're not here to crow. We're here to grow. I want you to say it. A church alive is worth the drive. I want you to say to the person next to you, our best days are ahead. first time I started calling people out and giving them scriptures I was in an organization that was too small for this they were traditional and predictable average church service in America that starts at 11 o'clock is known as the 60 minute countdown to benediction first time I got hate mail I was too fragile for it I just couldn't handle it I said to my mother because I hadn't gotten married yet and I was living at home I said how could anybody write a nasty letter like this to a person like me <laughs> that's so lovable I think one of the first blows I ever had in the ministry is to discover there's some people out there that don't like you. <laughs> and I was reacting to hate mail. My mother, bless her heart, she said, I want to give you a saying from Mark Twain. I said, we're quoting Mark Twain? And he said, yeah. Mark Twain says, you can't drown a man that is born to hang. And I said, oh, good, great. <laughs> I said, I know there's a message there, but it's not doing too much for me right now. I said, in Christianese, what does that mean? And she said, you and I have got to get ready for the big ones, like the firing squad, you know, the tribulation, the Antichrist. We've got to get ready for the rough times. She says, you can't let a lot of these little petty tests and trials get to you. You've got to wait for the big one, you know. And so it's not been one of my favorite slogans, but it's a Mark Twain slogan. You can't drown a man born to hang. I want to tell you where Brownsville is. There in Psalms 30, verse number 5. Weeping, past tense, has endured for the night. But now on this Sunday morning, joy is showing up. Say it, weeping endures for the night. Joy comes in the morning. I want you to say this is our day at new beginnings. Oh, hallelujah. 
I want to tell you something else where you're living. You're living in Psalms 126.5. Those that sow in tears are going to reap in joy. Oh, hallelujah. When the announcements came out of what you guys have been through over the last few years, the spirit was grieved within me. And the Lord says, I'm going to beat the devil at his own game. He said, I'm going to open the windows of heaven, pour out blessings. There's not even room enough to receive it. He said, I'm going to put the church on a 24-hour day basis of soul winning, Acts 2.47. The Lord added to the church daily. The souls were being saved. I want to tell all of you that work in this church, you're not going to have enough hours in the day to do all the things that you need to do. And I want to tell you something else. If you think you've been busy up to now, you haven't seen anything yet. Everybody say it's salvations on a daily basis. Blessings on a daily basis. Holy Ghost baptisms on a daily basis. Reclaim marriages on a daily basis. Deliverances on a daily basis. I want you to say to the person, get in, get out, or you're going to get run over. Would you say that? <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> it's the dawning of a new day. I had to cancel a campus group in Phoenix and Tucson, Arizona to be here today because my schedule's full and I didn't have anything open until about July, August, or September. And I talked to the guy and we set a date because I felt like I was supposed to be down here at this particular Sunday. And it's not because I'm here. It's because the Lord is letting me be a part of something he's doing. And I want everybody to turn to Haggai 2.19. I'm going to close with this one. Haggai 2.19. Because the day is the day on this one. It's out there in the Old Testament somewhere. Haggai 2.19. The seed's still in the barn. In other words, you really haven't had the results that you thought you should be having by now. It's page 864 if you have the same Bible I have. The vine isn't ripe. Everybody say it. The vine isn't ripe. The fig tree isn't ripe. The pomegranate isn't ripe. The olive tree is not ripe. Even though we had, don't have the results that we're expecting, I want you to say, nevertheless, nevertheless. From, this from this day forward, I am blessing you big time. Glory to God. Everybody say it. This is our day. Our day. day of new beginnings. Day of beginnings. Take the hand of the person next to you and pray with me. Is this the signal, Lindell, that my time's up? Oh, you keep going. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Everybody hold your Bible up. <laughs> okay, now take it down. We're going to do something else. We're going to have you hold hands. This is a hands-on church. I'm going to come down and pick some people out and give them words here. So, listen, you single guys that sit over in one corner like a bunch of wimps, <laughs> scared of the girls. Man, you're doing it all wrong. You need to check the chicks out and look over the place. Sit down with a pretty one. Three times in every service, Pastor John's going to say, let's take hands and pray, you know. <laughs> you wimps are missing it big time. Mingle. It's not too late. You can still get over there if there's a pretty girl and there's nobody sitting there. Get your frame over there because we're holding hands right now. Everybody say it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I release a word of wisdom. A word of knowledge. A word of faith, the healing word, the miracle word, the prophetic word, 
the discerning word, the interpreting word. In the name of Jesus, I release a love word, a joy word, and a peace word. I want you to say, sensitize Dick Mills to this audience. Let him say the right word to the right person at the right time. I'm going to be ministering to approximately 10 people prophetically at random from the audience. But I want you to hold your Bible up. And Isaiah 27, 5 says, reach out and take hold of the strength of the Lord. And here's the strength of the Lord. Because Daniel was flat down on the floor, face down, and he lost his constitutional strength. And you know what Daniel said? He said, I couldn't pick my buddy up off the floor. But he said, he gave me word, Daniel 10, 19. He gave me word and I was strengthened. So everybody hold your Bible up and just say, take hold of the strength of the Lord. You're going to hear some words that are going to strike a responsive chord. And you know what I want you to do? I just want you to say, I'll take that. Everybody, let's do that right now. I'll take that. Because I'm a good news guy, believe me. Betty Mills is going to write the words down. Okay, tell me what's happening. Okay, good enough. Betty Mills is going to write some words down on a piece of paper here that says a word from the Lord just for you. And uh, one of the men will be delivering these. Don't forget, the guy that delivers telegrams always gets a tip. Just You remember that now. <laughs> and when you get this piece of paper, it's going to have one to ten verses... What I want you to do is paste it to the back of your Bible or paste it to the door of your refrigerator. Whichever one you open the most. <laughs> Cheap shot. <laughs> so you're going with me, right? Yes. Okay. I've got a great, 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 great word. And it's for this sister right here. And I want you to stand up. I got the best news in the world for you. Can you stand up? Tell me your name. Barbara. Barbara. I've got a word for Barbara. And don't forget, all of these are for everybody. Barbara, get your seatbelt on. Acts 16, 31. It says, because you're a believer, salvation is going to reach every member of your household. It's coming to the whole family. They're coming in. Luke 19.9, salvation is coming to your household. Malachi 3.17, Barbara, there's a circle around the throne of God. It's a family circle. And the cir it's your family. And the circle's not going to be broken. Everybody said, Barbara, they're all going to be there. And I'll tell you how to speed it up. Betty's going to give you this piece of paper. When your relatives all come over, line them up across the kitchen, hold this piece of paper up and just say, I want to tell you something. You're all going to get saved. You might as well surrender right now. How many of you say, hey, I'll take that. There's a lady over here I want to bless big time. And she's this white lady with the white jacket there and a the beautiful smile. Yeah, please stand up. I got a word for you. Great word. Tell me your first name. Beatrice. B-E-A-T-R-I-C-E. -E. You got to realize that I'm not called to flatter people and butter them up. But I'm called to encourage people. Psalms 37. 37, Beatrice. It's got your name written all over it. It says, your faith is a complete faith. It's not flattery, it's a statement of fact. It's not a percentage faith, a fraction of a faith, 10% faith, a half faith. It's a complete faith. Everybody say, Beatrice, you got a complete faith. Yes. Plus, he's imparted to you a robe of righteousness. 
And it says in Psalm 37, 37, you find a person that's got a complete faith and an imparted robe of righteousness. I want you to say it. From this day forward, Beatrice, it's stress-free, pressure-free, tension-free, and hassle-free. Stress-free, pressure-free, tension-free, and hassle-free. How many of you say, hey, I'll take that. I want you to reach out to Beatrice and say, when you leave this world, Beatrice, you're going out in style. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of you say, hey, I'll take that. Got a good word for this young guy right here. Tell me your name. Jeremy. Jeremy. How old are you? 23. Is it J-E-R-E-M-Y? Yes. Okay. I notice you're not over there with the wimps. I notice you're sitting with the young lady here. <laughs> He's got it going for him. Jeremy? We all have an umbilical cord that goes from the back of our memory bank all the way to year one. Some of the memories are pleasant, some of them are unpleasant, some of them are tasteful, some of them are distasteful. God has a pair of scissors called forgetting, forgetting. And he's going to cut a cord to the past and let you walk away from every bummer memory out of the past, every bummer memory. Job 11:16, Jeremy. He said, I'm going to get into your cerebral region and I'm going to do a roto rooter on all the gobbledygook. We're going to scoop all that stuff out. Let you get on with life. Philippians 3:13, it says, You're going to forget everything that happened back there. And the guy that wrote this was there when Stephen got stoned. He was instrumental in Stephen's stoning. Then he gets in the kingdom and finds that Stephen's a real saint of God. He's got to live with the fact that he, he orchestrated the man's killing. And so he learned this, forgetting all those things that are back there, Jeremy. Turned around 180 degrees, looking right straight into the future and getting ready for tomorrow. I want everybody to say, Jeremy, tomorrow's where it's at. Jeremy, tomorrow's where it's at. And Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. He said, I'm doing a new thing for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So everybody say, Jeremy, your best days are ahead. Jeremy, How many of you say, hey, I'll take that? I got a word for this man here in the blue shirt. I got a great word for you. You want to stand up and what kind of work do you do? I'm a nurse practitioner. What's your first name? Charles. Charles, I got a great word for you. And you can stay right there because I want to go over and speak to everybody. I got a word for Charles, and there must be 150 people that need this word. It's Psalm 75, 6, and 7. King James, Charles, everybody said, your promotion is not coming from the east nor the west, the north or the south, but God's the judge. He's putting down one. He's setting up another. And the word set up is a jive word. You know, it's, it's hip talk, it's street talk for somebody sticking it to you. You guys says, man, I got set up for this one. But in the Bible, it's used favorably. I want everybody to say, Charles, the Lord is setting you up for promotion. <laughs> Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Charles, got your name written all over it. A man that unashamedly stands in the house of God with a respect for the book, for the leaders, for the people, for the church is not going to spend his life over on the shadow side of the street with malcontents, misfits, dropouts, and born losers. But he's going to be on the sunshine side of the street with the people that have the winning attitude. King James says, see a man diligent in his business, that man is going to be raised 
to high levels of leadership. He's not going to waste his time with non-entities. I've got good news. You're way overdue for a promotion. But it's more than just getting big bang out of your bucks. It's a spiritual promotion. Next level. It's a physical promotion. Next level. It's a financial promotion. Next level. How did that theme song go with the Jeffersons? Uh, moving on up? Yeah, moving on up? Well, how'd that go? To the east side? Yeah. To that deluxe apartment in the sky? Yeah. Moving on up? Finally got a piece of the pie. <laughs> Everybody say, Charles, you're just moving on up. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Now, how many of you want to move on up with him? Yeah. Pastor, I need the two of you to pick somebody out of the audience and bring him up here, would you? Brenda, walk with him, would you? Yeah, okay. I'm asked the pastor to pick out a... Uh, I could pick 50. Well, uh, just one people, couple. Uh, there's a couple of people I have in mind this morning. Uh, is Kim Searles here? Kim Searles? Come on down, Kim. Juanita Ogden, I want you to come up here, sweetheart. You got somebody? He, he wants us to pick out somebody who's really been through it in the last 36 months. Yeah, 36, 42 months. But still on their feet. Well, there's so many. Uh, there's so many. Uh, Betty, since I dreamed about Russ, come on up. Chaplain, they've already got you. I thought about you earlier. There's so many out there. I mean, everywhere I look, I'm seeing people. Um... No, that's her son. That's her baby. He was in Bible college and developed a brain tumor, and he's been an invalid, you know, ever since. That's been many years ago. Hey, Kim. I need the Mr. Bitter. I need your first name. Betty. Okay. I want to interpret the last uh, 42 months for you. Why you've gone through what you've gone through. You weren't out of God's will. He's not punishing you. You haven't done bad things and sin's catching up with you. Second Corinthians 1 4 says the God of all comfort will comfort you in every area of your life so that you in turn can comfort others that are hurting and are in trouble with the same comfort God's given you. He's comforting you so you can comfort others. Ezekiel 3.15, he said, I came to people who were sitting in bondage, locked up hand and foot. And Ezekiel said, I sat where they sat and I related to them. And Matthew 10, 8 says, freely or received, freely give. So you have a support system. Mm -hmm. And you're meeting people in the world that don't have a support system. And Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, underneath you are the everlasting arms. Mm -hmm. And so I got great news for you. God is comforting you so you can comfort others. He's given you encouragement so you can encourage others. He's given you joy so you can give joy to others. It's an isometric. It's a push and shove. Freely receive, freely give. And the only reason why we go through these things is so we can relate to the people out there that are walking around with one characteristic, and it's called normal depression. And you're going to be able to help a lot of people. Because the strength the Lord's given you, you're going to give to somebody else. The courage the Lord's given you, you're going to give to somebody else. And then the faith that he's given you and the comfort he's given you. And another thing, this is not a permanent situation. It is not a permanent situation. Along with the great move of the Spirit that is coming this way and has been released. And he says, from this day on, I'll bless you. Are going to be spontaneous signs and wonders and miracles in, in people that are just 
going to be memorable occasions. So I got good news. You're in line for some good stuff to happen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I want everybody to say it from Psalms 91, 15. I want everybody to say it. For every bad day you've had in the past, you're going to have a beautiful day in the future. For every miserable month you've had in the past, you're going to have a miracle month in the future. For every traumatizing year you've had in the past, you're going to have a triumphant year in the future. What was your name? Your first name. Betty. I want everybody to say, Betty, you're going to win the big enchilada. <laughs> okay, let's. Okay, and then I'm going to turn it back to you. Uh, the enemy has tried to take my life in many different ways in the last since October. He's, he's tried to, through my heart, he's, he's caused a um, major trouble with him. Well, let me, let me tell you why. And, and many other things, but that was. Okay. Are you the one he tried to get married off a while ago? Are you the one? No, okay. Uh, can you cook? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Forget the singing. <laughs> Let me tell you why uh, Satan's in a rage. He sees the damage that you're capable of doing single-handedly against his empire out there to the pulling down of strongholds yes. and he's got the troops lined up and he's you know his story is I'm going to huff I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow you away but Genesis 50 20 Joseph said to his brothers what Satan meant for evil God's going to turn into good Thank you, Lord. Nehemiah 13 2 Balaam was put, hired to put a curse on the children of Israel God turned the curse into a blessing and I just want you to know it's turnaround time for you. you it Lord. is turnaround time. Psalm 73. Everybody said from Psalm 73, 23, my heart and my flesh are capable of acting up on me. That's Psalm 73, 26. My heart and my flesh are capable of acting up on me but said God's the strength of my heart yes, God's the strength of my, heart. my portion forever my portion forever Psalms 27 14 wait on the Lord and be of good courage he will strengthen yes. your heart yes, Psalms 31 24 be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart oh hallelujah praise God Everybody said, I shall not die but live and declare the glory of the Lord. Psalm 66, 16, come ye that fear the Lord. And let me tell you the great things he's done for me. That's you. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you say, hey, I'll take that? Well, she says she's been claiming that scripture. Tell me your name. Kim. Kim. Hallelujah. Let's just wait on the Lord here because I'm getting something beautiful here. Jeremiah 31 3. He says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Isaiah 43, 4, he says, not only do I love you, but you're precious. Ephesians 1, 6, not only do I love you, not only are you precious, but you're accepted in the beloved. And Ephesians 2, 10, in the Jerusalem Bible, says, you're a special work of art. She stood before me and Jesus said, I'm gifting her today with a sense of personhood that will let her recognize her identity as a handmaiden of the Lord. 
And he just showed me shadows over the past where people tried to rob her of identity, tried to rob her of personhood, and where people didn't even accept her gender. And there were strong people trying to squeeze her into a mold of conformity and make something out of her God never intended and that she never wanted. And the Lord says, you're going to walk out of here realizing you're the Lord's handmaiden. Second Corinthians 6.16 and 6.18, he said, is it Kim, K-I-M? Kim? He said, I'm walking with you. You and I, hand in hand, are going into the future together. I'm communing with you. I'm fellowshipping with you. I'll be a father to you. And you're going to be my daughter. And I see shadows of people that have tried to rob you of personhood, identity, femininity, and being happy with who you are. I want you to put two hands together. In fact, I want everybody to just put two hands together because I'm going to turn it back to the pastor on this. And this is the big liberating word. This is going to liberate the church. It's going to liberate the leadership. It's going to liberate people. Just put two hands together. And in Jeremiah 40, verse number 4, he said, I'm loosing you this day from every chain that is on your soul. I'm loosing you this day. There's chains of financial adversity that need to be broken in Pensacola right now in Brownsville. I want everybody to say it. there's chains of fear, there's chains of insecurity, there's chains of lust, there's chains of anger, there's chains of bitterness. Jeremiah 40, verse number 4. Everybody put their two hands together and put them up like this. And we're going to say it three times. And then on the third time, we're going to take our hands apart. And we're just going to say, free at last, free at last. Praise God Almighty, I'm free at last. In fact, you're going to have to stand up on this one. Everybody stand up on this one. Because some of you are going to take off doing a hundred yard jazz for G, you know. Okay, let's start naming the chains. Let's just say financial adversity. Physical suffering. Personal anxiety. Discouragement. Weariness. Fatigue. Tired. Just say chains of lust. Chains of pride. Chains of religious bondage. Say it, Jeremiah 40, verse number 4. I loose you this day from every chain that's on your soul. Second time, I loose you this day. Say it, today, from every chain that's on my soul. I loose you this day, today from every chain that's on my soul. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's get into it. Oh, let's get into Hallelujah. it. Let's do Bless it. the Lord. Bless the Lord. Come on, praise oh, him. Oh, hallelujah. Go ahead and praise him. Thank you, praise Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let me uh, just take just a minute here before we move on into the service. I want to have Holy Communion this morning. I don't want to leave here without having Holy Communion. We miss it too many Sundays. And it's not right to miss Holy Communion. So we're going to do that in just a moment. But first of all, my mind goes back. I just can't get over the offering that we took up about three weeks ago, two, three or four weeks ago now, where a spirit of giving broke out here in the church. I'm getting letters, I'm getting communications of all kinds, people are calling, all kinds of things happening where people are calling and saying, Brother Kilpatrick, let me tell you what's happening. Even from last Sunday when I took a few, took a few testimonies on Easter Sunday, already even since then, people are telling us what's happened. I really sense, and I want to speak it out again today, I really sense that, that most of this congregation, most of you, 
have some pretty good seed, some pretty major seed in the ground, not just from that Sunday, but previous years. And I want to just speak over you now in the name of the Lord that suddenly and quickly, the seed that you have in the ground, just go ahead and break the soil. That He just goes ahead now and just cracks the soil and the blade comes up. Matter of fact, I just see it in my spirit right now. I see green just shooting up everywhere. I just see it. I don't see famine. I don't see drought. I see spring rains. Not floods, but gracious spring rains. And then the sunshine through the midst drawing the blades right up out of the ground. That's what I see. And I just speak blessings, financial blessings, upon this congregation because I know so many of you need it. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, money answereth all things. And many of you are at the place where you have some real financial obligations. And that money that you have in the ground, the seed that you have in the ground, God's going to kiss it and bless it. And he's going to help you meet some financial needs. I'd like to speak it over Brownsville Assembly. I'd like to speak it over BRSM. I'd like to speak that the, the debt is going to be taken care of at BRSM and at Brownsville Assembly. I just speak that in the name of Jesus. We had, let me just tell you this real quickly. Brother Mills, don't take lightly what the man said, anything that he said. Now, he's not God, of course, neither is any other human, but he's a man used by God. I love him because he uses Scripture, and he's an encourager. And it was refreshing for me to be here today and hear him minister to people. But when he called me on the telephone about four or five weeks ago, I had received a word from another prophet that called me. I was somewhere. I was in my coach again or somewhere. And another prophet had called me. A man, there's about three people that's used in prophecy. One of them is, um, is Brother Mills. Another one is um, the, the lady that, Cindy Jacobs, yeah, Cindy Jacobs that's been here, and then also Bill Hammond. Uh, these three have given me words that I know beyond any doubt God gave them to them. One time Bill Hammond gave me a word that was so explicit, it bowed me over when he gave it to me. It was so explicit, and it happened just exactly like that. Now, you don't base your life off of these prophecies, but they are powerful. And um, when Dick Mills called me about a month ago, he said, Brother John, I know some of the things you've been through. I know some of the things your church is going through. But he said, the Lord's word for you today is Ecclesiastes chapter 714. And I hadn't talked to him in years. I hadn't seen him in years. And he called me up and he said, I found you. And I wanted to give you this word. And he said, in the day of adversity, consider... And he said, in the day of prosperity, rejoice. He said, mark your calendar this day. He said, the adversity is subsiding now. And God's going to bless you. The blessings are going to increase. From the time he gave me that word, pow! I mean, things turned around. Now, we have about an $800,000 need at our school. Uh, from the time uh, we, we've got to cover... May, June, and July, school starts back in August. So I've got about three months where there's no income that we've got to meet. I have, a, well, it's more like about 600000 now that we just really got to believe God for. From the time he called me and gave me that word, the Lord blessed us with a check to pay our ministry off, Partners in Revival. It came in totally unexpected, blew me out of the water. A $175,000 check came to our ministry and paid it off. And that was a, a debt that I couldn't even pay on for two years because I have a budget that we have to meet and I couldn't even get above my budget to make that payment and it was paid completely off. That happened completely out of the clear blue within a month after he called. And then a check came in for BRSM right after that for $100,000. This week, two separate men got with one of the officials of the school, wanted to have lunch with him. One wrote out a check for 25000 and the other one wrote out a check for 25000 for BRSM. And listen, I want you to listen to me. 
I don't want you to take lightly what we're talking about here. Because you know in all the years I've been your pastor, 20 years, I've never done anything like this. And we're not going to stay on this long. But I don't want you to take lightly what I'm saying. I want you to put faith in the word of the prophet. And the Bible said if you believe the prophet, you will prosper. And I sense real strongly, like I told you last Sunday, that the waters are still troubled. Just like when the angel troubled the waters, as long as those waters were troubled, people got in and got healed. I believe that right now God has troubled the waters for people to be blessed financially. I still feel those waters are troubled. I still feel those waters are troubled. And there's been things come in totally unexpected, just totally unexpected that is shocked to me. These things have never happened before in all my 32 years of being in the ministry. They've never happened before. He calls and gives this word, pow, 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 pow. And they're just happening left and right. And I told him this morning, I said, Brother Dick, they're not over yet. The waters are still troubled. And so I speak over this place that the waters are still troubled. Get in. Get in. I'm giving you the word as your pastor. Get in those waters and let God bless you. Father, I speak a blessing over Brownsville right now. Over every family, over every individual, over the tithers. Lord, I speak a blessing right now over the debt that has choked us. All these years here at Brownsville. Lord, you have graciously poured out your spirit. People have come from all over the world. Lord, we have a debt of $7 million. I ask you, would you help us? Would you miraculously, divinely, supernaturally cancel that with $7 million? Lord, I don't know if it'll come with one check or a thousand checks, but would you cancel the debt of Brownsville Assembly? I ask it in faith as a pastor of this church, Lord. I believe the waters are troubled, and I ask for debt free for Brownsville Assembly. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask for debt free for BRSM. Lord, $10 million would pay the church and the school off. Oh my, wouldn't we be blessed? Wouldn't we be free? Wouldn't that be a testimony, Lord, of the provisions and the faithfulness of God? Lord, right now we release our faith for $10 million. For $10 million. For $10 million. We believe and we receive it. And Lord, every dime that comes in, we will immediately put it toward the debt, toward the bonds, and we'll cancel them as soon as you give us the money. Lord, it won't go for anything else. I give you my word, Jesus. Let the money come in and we'll slap it toward the dead immediately. For the ink can dry good. In Jesus' name. And Lord, just bless this congregation. I ask you, Lord, to let the phones at Browns will just start ringing off the hooks. Just the phones just start ringing. Oh, Brother Kilpatrick. Oh, Chaplain. Oh, Rose. Brother Richard, you won't believe what's happening. Lord, I just ask you for the phone calls to start rolling in. We release the angels of God right now. Lord, if they could take the chariot wheels off of chariots, they can bring some things as well as take some things away. And we just ask, Lord, that the angels of God be released to just begin to usher the blessings on Brownsville Assembly, Lord, and the people here. And Father, those that planted large, let them reap. Those that planted everything they had, let them reap. Lord, I just speak a time right now of reaping in the name of Jesus. Lord, I want to say it one more time today before I hush. I believe you for $10 million, Jesus. I don't have $64 faith anymore. I've got $10 million faith right now, Jesus. And I just believe you, Lord, for everything to be paid off. I believe it. If you've done it for others... You can do it for us, Jesus. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know who you're going to use. But you said you'll cause men to give into our bosom. In the name of Jesus, I just believe it right now. Amen. The brethren are going to come and we're going to serve you the Lord's Supper. Just remain standing as we worship for a few minutes with Brother Lindell. Hallelujah. 
You know, as we're as we're receiving communion, I was going to sing something else, but uh, just for Brother Mills this morning, let's do this. You have to pull out the old Church God hymnal to find these songs. I grew up on this song, Brother Mills. Some more folks around here did too, and I think it's appropriate. I started out to walk in the light, shining upon me from heaven so bright. I bade this world and its follies undo. I started in Jesus and I'm going through. I need some help. Come on. I'm going through. I'm going through. I'll pay the price. Whatever. started in Jesus and I'm let's go up I'd rather walk with Jesus alone and have for a pillow like Jacob stone living each moment with his face in view than to fail from my pathway and fail to go through everybody sing come on I'm going Pay the price. Whatever others do, whatever others do, I'll take this way. I'll take this way with the Lord's chosen few. With the I've started. I've started in Jesus. Church singing. I'm going through. Sing it, church. I'll pay the price. Whatever others do. Whatever others do. I'll take this way. I've started in Jesus. I've started in Jesus. And I'm going. I've started in Jesus. Come on. I've started in Jesus. And I'm going through. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you have made up your mind you're going through? Man, I made up my mind a long time ago. You know, if you don't, what's the alternative? Are you going back in the world? Come on, Pastor. What's it got to offer you? The world has nothing to offer me. If I left Jesus right now and went back, I'd be lost as a goose. I don't know what I'd do. Who are you going to turn to? Boy, I tell you what, whenever my last breath comes, I can say this. I don't care if I live to be 500 years old, I can say this. Jesus, you're the best friend I've ever had. He's a good friend. I made up my mind. No matter what comes, whatever comes, I have no control over it, but I made up my mind. 
I'm going to stick with God. You made up your mind? I want you to take the bread, please, and hold it reverently in your hand. Jesus, just don't know what we would do, Lord, without you. You're so precious to us, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, you are. Every morning I wake up, I always think about you. Last thing before I close my eyes, I always think about you, Jesus. You're the best friend that we've ever had. And you said, I give my body to be broken. A friend will lay down his life. You did that for us, Jesus. You did what many mothers and fathers couldn't do for their own children. But you laid down your life for us. You gave your life as a ransom for many. We reverence your body. We worship you, Lord. That's a word that we won't use for anybody or anything else. We worship you, Jesus. You are the object of our affection and the object of our worship. And there's none that can even remotely compare to you. And as we take this little emblem today of your body that was broken for us, we do it by faith. We receive it into our bodies. We receive your life. We receive your health. We receive your strength. Would you please partake with me? Hallelujah. Now take your cup and hold it reverently with me, please. Hold your cup reverently. The Bible says the life is in the blood. And this is the emblem and a symbol of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And because of his blood that was shed, there's life in his blood. And for those of you that feel dead, those of you that feel weary and worn, those of you that feel frazzled, beleaguered, I speak that there's life in Jesus' blood. There's strength. There's hope. There's courage in Him. And because He shed His blood, we can not only face tomorrow, but we can face today. And nobody in this church knows what you're facing person even on the pew right there with you don't know what you're facing this week I have a difficult day that I'm facing but the Lord knows and I'm going to ask right now that you just receive his life and his blood into you and as you receive it do it by faith and just let the strength of God rise up in you come on hallelujah brother Mills wants to take just a moment before we're dismissed. He wants to do something especially with our young people before we go. We all be seated if you would. Singer, stay with me, please. He's just going to be a moment. Please stay with me. I want all the kids from 13 to 19 to come right down to the front. We're going to commission you for signs, wonders, miracles, prophecies, visions, dreams, healings. 13 to 19. Come on up here. Fill up the steps up there. Thirteen to nineteen. From out of the balcony, we want kids thirteen to nineteen to come on down. Adults, don't ever say they're the church of tomorrow. I want to tell you they're the church of today. This great thing that's happening by the Holy Spirit is primarily touching young people. We got too many people lined up out there and we got not enough over here, so can we can you guys come on up and fill up these three? Rose up here, yeah. Just step up here and let's get some more bodies up here. Good enough. Let them fill up the areas there. Kids, put your hands up. Look at them. Did you wash them today? <laughs> Mom always told me, don't you come to the table without washing your hands. Your hands 
are an extension of the ministry of Jesus. He wants to put power in you so that he can flow through you and out of you to people. And I want you to look at your hands and I want you to say, these hands are an extension of the ministry of Jesus. He laid hands on the sick and they recovered. I can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. He laid hands on people and blessed them. I can lay hands on people and bless them. Everything he did with his hands, I can do with my hands. We know this is so because in the book of Acts, it said, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought. And the reason I have it down here is God wants to activate within you supernatural giftings. You don't have to wait till you grow up, get married, have four or five kids, get in your 30s and 40s, and then decide to get serious about spiritual things. The Lord wants you right now to be ready to move into the miraculous. As a result of today and today's commission, some of you are going to start getting words to give to people. It's going to be a new thing. It's going to be awesome. It's going to cause you to tremble. It's going to be exciting. But we're going to do what I've been doing in other churches, like Church on the Way, and also like Maybe Center, when we're at Maybe Center. We just ask the young kids to open up to signs, wonders, miracles, gifts, and dreams. And then we send them out in the audience, just touching people. I want to tell you, Billy Joe said, this is awesome. He said, things are happening. People are getting healed out there. People are and coming back. The kids are saying, I had a vision of Jesus. One girl came back and said, I saw an angel, and he's smiling at us. And one lady, one, you know, one young lady came to me. She says, I'm getting these words. Uh, and I said, do you know who they're for? And she says, yeah, that lady there. I said, well, go give her the word. Don't just keep it to yourself. And I feel that you've got to add to your terminology. Say it with me. Signs, Signs. Wonders, wonders, miracles, miracles. Gifts, of gifts of the Holy Spirit, dreams, dreams. Visions, visions, revelations. That's where it's at. I want you to say, that's where it's at. Put a couple hands out, and I'm going to read the words, and then pastor's going to say a prayer and then you're going to turn around and you're going to walk through this audience and upstairs and past the music group's going to do some music and some deliverances are going to take place right now hallelujah say it with me from mark 16 20 they went everywhere proclaiming the word and the lord working with them with signs following and that's going to happen to you today. I want you to say it with me from Hebrews 2, 4. They gave their witness. And the Lord came alongside. And added his witness to their witness. With signs and wonders. Divers miracles. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. I want you to say it with me from 2 Corinthians 12, 12, where Paul said, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. I want you to say it with me from Romans 15. Paul said, everywhere I went, people became obedient to the Lord. By word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that everywhere I went, miracles happened. And I want to tell you something, everywhere you go, kids, things are going to start happening. You're going to be campus evangelists. You're going to lead kids on the campus into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're going to see miracles take place. You're going to stop fights in the name of Jesus. You're going to come against violence in the name of Jesus. You're just going to see all kinds of things happening. It just said through the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought. Oh, hallelujah. And I just want you to hold them up again. Pastor, 
Could you come up and just commission these kids to start moving in the miraculous Everybody right stand now? Together, please. Yep. Hallelujah. Because I want you kids to turn around and go through the audience Hallelujah. when he gets through praying and just start touching people. And listen now, adults, don't pull any phony stuff on us. Don't act super spiritual like, eh, the kids are having their little thing, you know. Yeah. These kids are going to touch yeah. you. You're going to fall under the power. Yeah. God's going to heal you. Miracles are taking place. It's going to happen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Put your hands up, young people. I, I bless you in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus. I bless you as your pastor for God to open up a brand new arena of ministry for you. I speak that signs and wonders and miracles begin to just take place through your hands. God to give you new eyes to see with, a new tongue to speak with, something to begin to come out of your hands that's never come out of your hands before. For God to begin to open up doors for you. God to begin to send you to people that once would intimidate you. Now you'll begin to move and ministry to them. For God to give you a sure word. I said a sure word. You'll not be unstable. You'll not be intimidated. You'll not be in the fear of man. But you'll get past that. You'll kick into another gear. And you'll move in a freedom of the spirit. And a boldness that you haven't known before. Now we release you right now in the name of Jesus to go in this audience. Come on. Go in this audience. Begin to move around in this audience. Audience, receive them. Audience, receive them. Just go through the audience. Go on. Go ahead. Just start touching people. And come on out. Just make it easy for them to reach you. Just make it easy for them to reach you right now. Yes, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Just move out the audience. Just touch people. Hallelujah. I'm trading my sorrow.